All right. Well, I'm excited. My name's George, uh, pastor here at The Gathering. It's great to see everybody. Those joining us uh, online or after the, watching this later, uh, those of you outside enjoying the sunshine, uh, can you believe it's like January and this, we just get blessed with this beautiful weather? It's awesome. This is awesome. I feel sorry for all those Californians that left for like Idaho or Montana. They're like, oh, snow is heavy. It's hard to shovel. Uh, I want to just go over, uh, I want to touch on uh, three things from this week's past reading. If you're reading along in the Bible with us, we're in Exodus. Uh, if you haven't been reading along, you can uh, just do that by uh, getting our app and, and clicking on the daily reading program and signing up for that. Uh, and it's just all there right on your app. I set a reminder for myself at 545 every morning, my phone goes bing, time to get up and read the word. Uh, and it just helps me stay on track, and there you can see who else is uh, reading, and there's comments. Peter Varberg always puts great comments out there. Uh, I'm not, I'm like, I don't write well until I've had like three or four cups of coffee, so uh, I don't have that kind of clarity that early. Um, but one of the things that we see is that, that Israel has come out of the land of Egypt, and they're, they're uh, having this experience. They've been longing for freedom. They've been longing to get out of slavery. They've been longing to be the people of God. And this part of the story is this process of them transitioning from an identity of being slaves to actually being the people of God. And it's actually a little more complicated than I think they anticipated, right? It's like, oh, all we have to do is just leave. Right? And then everything's going to be perfect. They have this expectation of easy. Right, Everything's going to be easy. We're going to be out from under Pharaoh's thumb, and, and everything will be great. And if you've been following along, the story doesn't quite go like that. Uh, and so I want to talk about how do we actually become the people of God? What does that actually look like for us? And how can we lean into freedom and really have that start to permeate our identity instead of the, the slavery and the bondage kind of being uh, what permeates our identity. And so I'm not going to read a passage because I'm really going to, I'm going to kind of cover like six chapters, and it would take me my full 40 minutes to read those six chapters to you. So I'm just going to highlight some, some scriptures as we go along. But if you want to jump in, it kind of starts in Exodus 14. Uh, that's where we're going to kind of pick up the story. If you want to open your Bible to Exodus 14 uh, or your Bible app or whatever, you can follow along there. And to, to give you a little background, this is the, the first of three. I want to look at just three of the, the situations that they find themselves in. Uh, and I want to look at the situation, reaction, and then application to those three circumstances. And they've, they've finally been set free from Egypt. They've come out, and I love in, in uh, I think it's in chapter 13, it says they, lay, they, they left with fists raised in defiance, right? So you see him kind of walking out, you know, Pharaoh maybe standing on his balcony watching this great exodus, and everyone's like, yeah, you know, uh, you know, kind of just... Uh, I don't know if that's like the, the, the Exodus version of giving him the bird or something, you know. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're kind of just saying, you know, kind of, you know, in your face, Pharaoh, we're leaving. We're free and there's nothing you can do about it. And I love how when we get saved, we kind of have that attitude with the devil, right? We're like, yeah, there's nothing you can do about it. I'm free. Jesus has set me free. And then they, uh, they, they leave. And I want... The, the first thing they encounter is what I'm going to call divine difficulty. Divine difficulty. They're on their way out to the, to the promised land. They've left with fists raised in defiance. And then God tells Moses to actually go the wrong direction. I'm going to put a map up on the, on the screen here in a second. But there's actually a direct route to the promised land. And God tells Moses, no, don't, don't go on the normal trade route that would be like a four-day journey. 
because I've got a 40-year experience for you uh, coming. It wasn't actually, 40 years wasn't God's plan, uh, but it was a longer experience, probably about a two-year experience, to help them embrace their new identity so that they could actually take possession of and keep, hold on the promises that God had for them. So God tells Moses to go the wrong direction. They, they come down um, and they get stuck. The situation is they get stuck between an army and an ocean. All right, so it sends them down the wrong way. They kind of get stuck between the, the Red Sea and Pharaoh sees it and goes, oh, they're trapped. And Pharaoh gets his whole army and heads out in pursuit of this ragtag band of a, a million plus slaves that have just left, his whole labor force has left. And this is interesting that this is actually God directed. The, their very first experience in freedom is divine difficulty. He actually plans it out. Uh, and I want to show you kind of what happened, right? So this is Egypt. They're up in the land of Goshen up here. And instead of following one of those dotted, the black dotted lines that are the established trade routes that take you pretty quickly right to the promised land, they cut down to where Migdal is right there on the coast. And now they're kind of trapped and Pharaoh can just go right after them and they've got nowhere to retreat. You see that? All right? And so what's interesting about this is that God says, he tells Moses, I'm going to send you this direction because I want to bring about a total victory over Pharaoh. I want to destroy his whole army and I want to bring about my glory. So this divine difficulty is intended to bring about a greater victory and God's glory, all right? So what's their reaction to this divine difficulty? It says the people looked up, they saw Pharaoh coming, and they panicked. They absolutely panicked. And uh, in that, that panic, the, they do two things. One's good, one's not so good. The first thing they do is they cry out to God. They're like, God, help us. Right? The, the not so good is they complain to Moses. Right? And they're like, why'd you bring us out here to die? Right? Weren't there enough graves to bury us in Egypt? And, they, and they're totally panicking. Um, everything uh, looks horrible to them. And then look at what uh, Moses says to them. What's the application? Look at this. In Exodus 14, it says, Moses told the people... Don't be afraid. Say, don't be afraid. don't be afraid. Stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. Say, watch the Lord. Watch the Lord. Right? The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Say, stay calm. Stay calm. Right? So this is our application. This is our application. The first application is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Moses is saying, don't let fear displace your faith. When things get difficult, when things get hard, when things get challenging, when you don't see a way out, don't let fear displace your faith. Don't let it push your faith out of the way. Because remember, they, what have they been experiencing the last few months with the, the 10 plagues in Egypt and God's massive deliverance and, and being finally set free? They've been building this faith. And then the first challenge they come across, instead of having faith, they let fear give a nationwide panic attack. And then the second thing he tells them to do is watch for what God will do. Watch for what God will do. And here's the thing. It's easy when we're new in our faith to allow our focus to be consumed by the challenge or the difficulty. And our expectation is the worst instead of the miraculous. And this is where we need to grow in becoming the people of God because the world has that expectation. When things start to go bad, the world expects the worst. They expect the worst of people. 
They expect the worst of their motives. They expect the worst outcomes. They, they, you know, it's just all doom and gloom. But what do the people of God need to do? The people of God need to have an... Since we are the people of God, since God is for us, since God has delivered us, since we belong to God, our expectation shouldn't be for the worst, it should be for the miraculous. When things go bad, this is what faith is. My expectation is for God to work. For God to work a miracle, not for the world to give me its worst. And so don't be afraid. Watch what God will do. Shift your, focal, your focus from uh, disaster to deliverance, right? There should always be this expectation in whatever difficulty comes our way that God is at work. God hasn't abandoned me. God hasn't left me. God isn't going to, uh, you know, do all of this. God's not going to send his son to die on the cross, to save me of my sin, to bless me with every spiritual blessing, give me an eternal inheritance, fill me with his spirit just so he can ruin my life. It makes sense. Sounds kind of ludicrous when you put it that way. But isn't that how quick, how often we think? Right? It's not all roses and Godiva chocolate, and, and now it, it must just be horrible. Right? Life is miserable. God's ruining this. I should never have, have, have chosen to, to get in ministry or go to the impact or, or serve at the church or, or do any of these things. Right? It's just, I mean, we start to immediately going, you know, it was just better to be a slave. I should have just stayed a slave. Uh, at least it was predictable. Right? It was kind of a, 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 you know, a slow, miserable existence, but it was consistent. Right? Now I've got these challenges coming in my life. And then the third thing is to stay calm and continue on. Just stay calm and continue on. God actually tells Moses, why are you crying out to me? Right? Why are you crying out to me? Lift your hands. Oh, stay, you know, lift your hands over the... the, not the the Red Sea, I'm going to part it, and you guys just keep going. I'm going to do something miraculous. And that's what our expectation should be on. So, you know, just stay calm and continue on. This is what Paul says when he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, right? Just let the peace of God be what controls you, what controls your decision-making, controls your, your focus, controls your attitude. Let that be what's in charge. Let the peace of God rule your life. Wouldn't that be nice? All right, just to, and this is what it means to be the people of God, that our expectation is for the miraculous. The peace of God rules our lives. We can just stay calm and carry on, trusting that God is going to do what only he can do. So that's the first thing, right, is this, this, uh, the, this divine difficulty that they experience and, and how God works through that and, and begins to show them what it means to be the, the people of God. Jump down to, to chapter 15, and uh, we're going to see that they're going to come out of Egypt, they're going to uh, cross the, the Red Sea, it's going to swallow up all the Egyptians, they're all going to die, the entire army of, of Pharaoh is wiped out, and they actually have the first worship event recorded in the Bible. This is the first, this is like a one day, or passion, or what are the new ones now? What? No, no one knows? The gathering. <laughs> right? You know, the, you know the, the, those big worship events where like, you know, 100,000 people come out. My uh, sister-in-law sent us a video. She and her daughter went to this event. I think it was a Hillsong event in Arizona. It was like 60, 70,000 people, right? And she's like, ha, 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 we're not in California, right? And, uh, you know, it's just this massive worship gathering. And, and this is the first one recorded in the Bible. They actually write two brand new songs, right? Uh, they're publishing worship. It's exciting. And the whole congregation is worshiping right there on the, on the, the shore, praising God for his victory and deliverance. And, and it's just this incredible time. And, and then two days later, they come to their first spring, and the spring is bitter, and so they just keep on worshiping. No. No, I wish they did. 
right? They come across some bitter circumstances. They come across some bitter circumstances where the situation is what should be refreshing actually turns out to be bitter, right? And now remember that they had just come off this incredible uh, deliverance, this worship event. Um, they, they, uh, the first spring they come to is, is bitter. And look, it, this is a real pain point. I don't want to minimize this. It's a real pain point. You're out there in the desert with your family, and you come to the first you know, in and out burger, and they've got a salmonella outbreak, right? And there's nothing to eat. Uh, there's, there's nothing to drink. This is a real serious problem. It's not an imaginary one. You can't go very long in the desert without water, right? That makes sense? And so here they are. They come to the first spring. They're out in the middle of the desert, and and, uh, you know, a, a number of years back at Impact, we took this epic trip to uh, Egypt, Jordan, and Israel, kind of walked the whole Bible in three weeks. It was incredible. Um, and we went to where this spring, where this place is called Mara, and it is a wasteland. They actually, it's so, it's so deserty out there that they have sand plows, not snow plows, they have sand plows because the roads get covered with sand and they've got to keep plowing it off this. So they're, they're in this kind of just barren, there's no shade, it's just sand. And, and you come to this one place, it looks like, oh, finally, fresh water, and it just turns bitter. You, you can't really drink it. And so look at their reaction. What's their reaction to this? It says the people complained against Moses. Notice they went from complaining to Moses to now they're complaining against Moses, right? And, and their reaction is understandable, right? It's, a re it's an understandable reaction. Seems like uh, there's a leadership issue here, right? We've got a serious issue and it seems like a failure of leadership, right? Who takes a million people out into the desert without a plan for water? Right? You just think about it. If you're an Israelite, you're following Moses. You're like, dude, what are you thinking? Did, why couldn't you have sent someone out ahead to scout this out? Right? Find us a decent spring. Don't bring a million people to a spring we can't drink from. Don't tease us like this. This is a, a you know, it seems like a, a real leadership failure, a lack of planning, something that could have been anticipated. Uh, something that could have been mitigated. And this is the reality. When you, you join God's people, sometimes there are leadership issues. Sometimes there are real problems where things could have been thought out in advance. Things could have been done better. And I'm, I'm, the, I'm the chief leadership failure at the gathering. That's me. I'm the failure in chief, right, uh, of this whole thing, right? There's always stuff that we could have anticipated better, led better, done better. Uh, and, and, uh, and we should, right? And we should get better, and I should get better, and I should do all these things. No excuse for that. But notice, even though it's understandable, their reaction isn't helpful. Even though it's understandable, complaining is never helpful. And it's not what the people of God are supposed to do. It's not what it's meant, what, what it means to be the people of God. Now, it doesn't mean, I'm not, and, and I don't want you to, to hear that I'm saying it's okay for leadership to continue in cycles of failure. I'm not saying that, and the people of God should just suck it up and deal with it. I'm not saying that at all. Leaders need to grow and get better, but complaining never helps, all right? In fact, what we're going to see, well, beginning to, I want to, what does it mean to complain? I want to, uh, to dive into this a little bit, and I want to bring in a resource uh, called the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. Uh, anybody that, that studies the Old Testament, this is like the 
foundation for understanding Hebrew. This is the classic, uh, most uh, respected and most used resource in studying uh, the Hebrew language. And this is what they say about this word complained against Moses. To complain against means to express resentment, dissatisfaction, anger, and complaint by grumbling in half-muted tones of hostile opposition to God's leaders and the authority which he has invested in them. All right, so that's the definition of this word. It, it actually, in Hebrew, it sounds like rr, 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 rr. Right? We have the word murmur. Right? These half muted tones. It's never a clearly articulated concern. You understand the difference? Complaining is never a clearly articulated concern. It's a grumbling that just is kind of under the surface that can never be addressed because it's never really articulated. That's the difference about complaining and expressing a concern, right? If you have a concern about something someone's doing, what should you do? Say it clearly. Express it clearly. Don't just go around going, you know, gathering, you know. That's, that doesn't bring about any solution. And the Bible actually says that it's sin. Right? And these three reasons why complaining is a sin. One, it doesn't give an opportunity for healing, restitution, or reconciliation. If someone does something that hurts you and all you do is grumble about it, you're, that relationship is going to stay broken. You're going to stay hurt and not be healed. And there's never, you're never going to give the, anybody an opportunity to make it better. That make sense? All right. Second reason complaining is a sin is it foments frustration, heightens hurt, and sows discord. When you go around going rah, 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 what it does is other people that have a feeling of being hurt, what do they do? Yeah. Right? And then they somebody else hears, hey, what are you guys talking about? Oh, right? I got to share. Right? And all of a sudden it's just foaming frustration it's heightening the hurt and it sows discord among the people and that's not what god's people do that's not what god's people do All right because love is supposed to be what drives everything we do and here's uh, there's a great book i don't know if you guys have ever read it called the bait of satan uh, the Bait of Satan. It's a great book, and it basically, the author's contention is that offense is the bait that Satan always puts on his hook to catch you. If he can get you offended by something, he's hooked you, right, into a whole bunch of nastiness. Uh, and here's the thing. We, we talk a lot about how uh, we, we are hurt because someone didn't love me correctly, and that's often true and it's often the case and there are often times where i'm busy or short with people or I make decisions without thinking about the impact that it has on others and people feel unloved as a result and that's wrong on my part and, and i need to repent and and get better at it and change that and if you come to me right and clearly articulate it what does it give us an opportunity to do yeah, let's me make restitution. How can I make that better? Right? It lets us reconcile and it lets healing happen in the relationship. That's what God's pe how God's people are supposed to act. That's what it means to be the people of God. When it doesn't happen, what the devil, what, what kind of, it's kind of a double down on being unloving. Right? So someone was unloving to me, and then I don't say anything. I just mum, murmur and complain. I am being unloving right back. You see that? There's nothing loving about And it takes both people, right? Uh, and, and being hurt is not an excuse to turn around and hurt others. 
And so this is what it means. So we, we all need to grow in this area where we're saying, hey, let's be loving. If you hurt me, I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to articulate that clearly so that we can reconcile, and, and there can be restitution, and there can be healing in this scenario. That's what the people of God do. All right? And so what's the application for us? Look at what uh, Moses says. So Moses does. He says he cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Moses threw it into the water, and it made the water good to drink. The Hebrew is there. It actually made it sweet. It was there at Marah that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands, keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent out of the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. All right, I love that. Here's the application. When we encounter bitter circumstances, we need to cry out to God for help. We need to cry out to God for help. Don't complain against others. Right? Cry out to God. Right? Complaining doesn't bring a solution. It only adds to the, the, the bitterness. And here's something that I thought was interesting. This isn't really in the text, but something that just struck me. I was thinking, gosh, what would I have done if I was Moses and I came to this bitter circumstance? My first reaction would be, well, let's move on from it. Let's go find something better. Right? Doesn't that seem reasonable? Right? If you counter something, a bitter spring, let's go find one that isn't bitter. And so often that, I feel like, is our go-to response. When we encounter a bitter circumstance, a, a bitterness in a relationship, our natural inclination is, let's move on and go find something that's, that's sweeter than this. But that's not what God has Moses do. God cries out to Moses, and God doesn't say, well, Moses, just move on. Just cut those ties get past that difficulty. No, God shows him a piece of wood and th to have him throw, I don't know if it's like a piece of driftwood sitting there or something, and a dead tree. Moses throws it into this spring and the whole thing just clears up and gets fresh again. I love this idea of not moving on when things are bitter. When Nan and I were in Austria, we were really working at the, the Bible college there. We really struggled in our, our first year with the leadership. And, uh, and I got to confess that I was one of these grumblers. I uh, wasn't the head guy. Uh, and so I was, uh, so it's easy when you're not the head guy to say, oh, this guy, right? And rah, 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 rah. And, and other people on staff are like, yeah, rah, 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 rah. And uh, so we were, gonna, we were just going to leave after our first year. We made a one-year commitment. We were going to leave. Relationships were tense and tight, and there was a lot of strain uh, and, uh, you know, almost kind of dividing the college into fractions, right? Uh, you know, I'm with George, or I'm with this guy, you know, and, and we kind of all had our, our vying for power kind of thing. And a friend of mine, older mentor, came out, and I said, yeah, he's like, so what are you going to do? I was like, well, I think we're going to move on. And he said, tell me why. And so I explained, well, you know, we don't really agree with the leadership here. They're not really following the vision we had talked about. And, and these things make it difficult and hard and, and all these things. And he said to me, I want to strongly exhort you not to leave when things are bitter. Stay until God makes it sweet. And then if you still want to leave, it's more likely that God's leading you and you're not running. And that was a life-changing principle for me, to realize that it's never God-glorifying to leave when it's bitter. But to pray, cry out to God and say, God, what would it take to make this sweet? And that's the, ne that's the next point, right? Is let God show you how to make it sweet. What would it take? Get it there? <laughs> what would it take to move from bitter 
to better. And another mentor of mine said, you know, the only, you guys know, you've heard that before, right? The only difference between bitter and better is I, all right? Better turns to bitter when I'm in the middle of it, when the focus is on me, when I'm the center of that problem, when I'm not crying out to God, but it's all about me, that's when things can't turn better, they just stay bitter, So let God show you how to make it sweet. Cry out to him. Let him show you how to make it sweet. And then don't forget that God has a standard of faithfulness. Remember he said at this event, he said, I'm going to set this Mara experience, this bitter circumstance, as a standard to test their faithfulness. And so here's the standard. When people or circumstances make your life bitter, how are we responding to it? What's God's standard for that? Don't let things stay bitter. Cry out to Him, let Him make it sweet again. That's the standard of faithfulness. That's what God's people do. When things turn bitter, they cry out to God and say, God, make it sweet again. Show me what it would take. What do I have to throw into the middle of this in order for it to become sweet again? That's what the people of God do. The people of God don't just move on and leave a trail of bitter springs behind them. They cry out to God and say, God, you show me how to make this bitter. Let him bring the healing that you need. And I love that. He says, if you'll do this, I'll be the God who heals you. I'll heal all this hurt. I'll heal all this this, this disease. I'll heal the impact and the effects of sin and other people's sin in your life. I'll heal you. I'll give you that that, that clean heart, that freshness in your soul i'll give you that that joy i'll give you that peace i'll i won't let sin the things that other people have done to hurt you and the things that you do that that hurt yourself and other people i'm not i won't let that stay wounds in your life if you'll be of that standard of faithfulness well you'll seek me to make the bitter things sweet then i will be the one exactly right right? <laughs> right? That he's saying, I'll be the one that heals all of that. Isn't that what we want? We, as the people of God, we want to be people who are healed from the negative effects of sin, not people that are walking around wounded and infected with it. Let's let God heal us of all those hurts. Let's go, let God heal us of all those misunderstandings. Let's let God heal us of all those hiccups in our relationship instead of holding grudges like protecting uh, splinters that are, are, have pierced into us that are only going to get infected, more infected over time. Does this make sense? All right, so that's the, the second thing that the people of God do. And then the third thing that they run into is depleted resources. Jump down to chapter 16. Jump down to sit in chapter 16. The situation here is what I'm calling unfulfilled. They are unfulfilled. They get out, so they, they finally got the water situation solved. They've come to an oasis after they leave Mara. It's a beautiful 70 palm trees, all these springs. It's a beautiful place if you've never been there. And they, 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 they've got the water problems solved, but they're about a month into freedom now. So imagine you've gone on, anybody been on a long road trip? Imagine being on a road trip and there are, in, like you're a road trip in the middle of Texas. Anybody drive through Texas? Like there's whole sections where you're like, dear God, if my car breaks, I'm dying, right? Because there is nothing, Right? There is nothing. There's no gas. There's no roads. You know, there's no of those rest stops. There's nothing out there but desert. This is what it's like. So imagine you've been a month on the road with no 7-Eleven, right? There's no place to buy groceries for your family. So a month in, they are running out of food. They're running out of resources, 
Now, I want you to realize this is a problem caused by freedom. This is a problem caused by freedom. When they were slaves, their oppressors fed them every day. When they were slaves, their oppressors fed them every day. The same is true to us. When we are slaves to sin, the devil feeds us a daily diet of temptation and opportunity to sin. Now say, I'll give you something that will fill you. Right? It's poisoning you slowly, but you're full. Full of yourself, right? Feel full of anger, full of resentment, all these things that come with a lifestyle full of guilt, full of shame. We're full when we're slaves to sin. And we're being fed every single day. But now they're a month into freedom. And think about this. All they've experienced is divine difficulty, bitter circumstances, wilderness wanderings, and now they're running out of resources. Not a great, right? It's like, wait, this isn't quite what the preacher said when I came down to the altar, right? He didn't say I was going to get divine difficulty, right? I was going to have bitter circumstances. I'd wander in the wilderness, and I would be emptied of myself, right? I don't think many people would respond to that kind of an altar call. But that's the reality. And this problem has been building slowly over time. It's not a sudden crisis. This is a slow build, right? Resources are being drained, and there's nothing in there that's filling. It's a slowly increasing problem. Right? There's no more, they're not full anymore. They're, they go to the, the, the food wagon, and instead of it being packed to the, the top, it's now like, wait, that's, all we have is sardines and olives? Right. Yeah, that's it? Right? Where's the bread? Where's the fruit? Where's the good stuff? And there's, they're not getting filled by anything else. I don't know if you've ever had this experience spiritually, where it just seems like you're wandering in a desert, life keeps taking, right? People, you still need to give out forgiveness, you still need to have patience. You still need to provide grace. And you feel like your resources are running dry. All right? Maybe you're in a, a season with a... I remember when our kids were first born, right? It's like, holy cow, I am just drained. I would actually fall asleep at stoplights. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, all right, I'm just sitting there and somebody's, somebody's honking at me. I'm like, I'm awake, I'm awake. Where am I going? I don't know, I'll just go forward, Right? where you just feel drained all the time. Right? There's, there's seasons in life where work is demanding, the kids are demanding, finances are demanding, ministry is demanding, and it feels like you're just getting drained. You're just giving and giving and giving, and there's nothing that's filling you anymore. And as a result... It's a problem that starts to make slavery look appealing again. And that's what happens with the Israelites. They go, man, when we were back in Egypt, we were full all the time. This whole selfless life, this whole people of God thing is draining. It actually felt more fulfilling to be carnal to be worldly, to focus on myself, to have my own schedule, to have Sundays to sleep in and do whatever I want. Right? To, uh, and, and that's this, this, this challenge that comes up. In Egypt, we had plenty to eat, and, and there, I wasn't struggling as much before I got saved. So that's the situation. What's their reaction? Notice this time they expand the circle of blame. So it started complaining to Moses. Then they complained against Moses. And in this chapter, they complain against Moses and Aaron and God. Right? So it's like, it's not enough. We can't just keep blaming Moses for all our problems. We've got to expand the circle here. 
right? It's got to it's got to be more people to to justify all my frustration. So let me expand the circle of blame, right? And this is what they say: it's Moses' fault, right? He's in charge; he should be doing better. It's Aaron's fault; he's the spiritual leader; he should be doing more to help us here. And ultimately, it's God's fault because he's the one who's leading us with this nebulous cloud thing of his, all right? They just expand the circle of blame. And again, I get it. It seems like such a reoccurring leadership issue, doesn't it? Right? It's like, hey, we didn't learn anything from the water scenario, right? Clearly, we should have planned better for that. Now we've got the same thing going with the food. Why aren't we planning better? What's wrong with our leadership team? And, you know, there's, it's a legitimate complaint. But notice that ultimately, this becomes a test of our emergency heart response system. Right? Yes, there, there are some things that maybe the leadership could be doing differently. But it's also, we don't want to ignore the fact that there's also an opportunity for us in it. All right? That instead of expanding the circle of blame, God says, I'm going to test you with something. God was going to... God's going to give them an application that I think is one of the most practical and profound applications for us today. First application embrace daily dependence embrace daily dependence and this is something that goes completely across the grain of our culture what are we always taught be self-sufficient save up right uh don't don't ever find yourself in a dependent situation right that's the worst thing possible you got to save for a rainy day. You've got to plan ahead. And I'm not saying that none of that those things are bad. What I'm saying is there's a heart attitude that the people of God have that's unique to this world. And this is that I embrace daily dependence. And out of this, this is a this is going to be the test of their emergency heart response system, right? It's going to be this thing that they had to be gatherers, not hoarders. And here's the thing. God was saying, I'm going to give manna every morning. I'm going to blanket the desert with something that's kind of like wafers with honey in it. And you've got to go out and gather it yourself. You've got to go out and gather as much as you need. And in that gathering you will find daily fulfillment. But here's the deal. By the time the sun gets hot in, in the desert, anybody ever been out to the desert? By what time is the sun hot? <laughs> yeah, depending on what time of the year, right? 6 a.m., right? God said by the time the sun's hot, it's all going to melt away. So this has to be what this does. The, the, the genius, God's genius is in this, is it makes it, it forces it to be your true priority in the day. And I know we, we've taken this word priority and we have uh, kind of manip we've kind of mutilated the word priority, right? We've actually made it plural, which is, an, it is nonsensical because the word priority means the first thing. So how can you have the first things, right? Because the first thing is always number, what's the second priority? Two, that makes it no longer the priority, right? And so what God does by saying before the sun gets hot, this going out and gathering your, your bread from heaven has to be the priority. Because if you don't make it the priority, you lose the opportunity. That make sense? If it's not your priority... You, you will lose the opportunity for fulfillment that day, and you'll go hungry. Does this make sense? All right, so uh, God said, I'm going to provide everything you need for the day, but you've got to be a gatherer. 
And then the other condition was, it's only going to be good for one day. This is the embracing this idea of daily dependence. And some people are like, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want like a three day work week, right? So I'm just going to go and I'm going to gather twice as much, right? And I'm going to stock up and that'll carry me through. If you remember the story, if you've been following us along with us reading every day, what happened to those who left it, who tried to keep extra for the next day? It spoiled, and it smelled, it stunk, and it had maggots in it, right? So it had this foul odor, it had maggots in it, it was complete. Not only was it rotten, everyone could tell that it was rotten in your tent, right? You walk by and you're like, oh, Ephraim, why'd you do that again, right? You know? Just be daily dependent. And this is what happens in our life spiritually when we think we can go for more than a day without daily dependence on the Lord. Our spiritual life starts to stink. And other people can smell it too, right? Uh, I don't know about you. For me, the stench comes out in my attitude, right? It comes out in the, the, I have maggots of impatience, uh, that fill my day, right? Uh, and I have the stench of, of hurried and busied and, and uh, you know, frustrated. All these things are coming out of my spiritual life because I haven't gone to the Lord for my daily fulfillment. And I'm trying to live off of yesterday's gathering and all it's producing is stench, rottenness, and maggots in my life. And so let that lead us to gathering, not complaining. And I'm not trying to like lead you to the gathering, right? Not this <laughs> church, but to gathering sustenance from God's word every day, right? And this is the real indicator whether or not you are leaning into this identity of a daily dependent on God person is you will see yourself with the need to go gather from his word every day as your first priority. This is what the people of God do. It's who we are. We're not in slavery. That We're not looking to the world or the devil to feed us the things that, that nurture and sustain our souls. We're saying, I'm going to go to God. I'm His. I belong to Him. It's with Him that I'm going to find that fulfillment. It's with Him that I'm going to find that sustenance. It's with Him that I'm going to find the patience. It's with Him that I'm going to find the grace. It's with Him that I'm going to find the love. It's with Him that I'm going to find the peace. That's where I'm going to get it, from Him, from His Word. And it, be because I believe that to my core, I'm going to go gather every single day. And if I don't gather, and I'm hungry, and I'm starving, and my life stinks, whose fault is it? It's mine, because I chose to neglect it. And I get, sometimes I, I just get busy. I, you know, I, it's my job to read the Bible, and sometimes I don't do it, Right? And I get it, and my day stinks as a result. But I love that his mercies are new every morning. And great is his faithfulness. And he doesn't say, hey, you stink, you can't come anymore. Right? It's not, God doesn't have a sign like no shoes, no service, right? No mask, no service, right? God's like, come, come, right? Come get that fulfillment. Come get that nourishment, come get that, that, that satisfaction for your soul. Right? I'm sorry about the mask comment. That was uncalled for. Uh, it's not, I'm not slamming. I was just thinking of all the signs. It wasn't a, because uh, I know people are like, George is against, I'm not anti-maxing. <laughs> it just came to mind because I had a, a kind of a kid date day yesterday. And so Ellie won, we went with Ellie in the morning to get manicured. My nails look nice. Right. This place was the bomb. Guys, if you don't know about manicures, get the deluxe. They massage your arms, they massage my neck, they put like peppermint oil on these like, 
you know, pressure points. I was like, holy cow, this is like spa treatment, <laughs> right? I feel like I'm on a cruise. Uh, and so, but the, 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 I had forgotten my mask in the truck and I walked in there and it was like, oh, you have that. And I was like, oh, so that's why that came to mind. It's not a, I'm not, so, okay, just want to make sure because I don't want you to get <laughs> Satan to put that, I'm fixating. <laughs> I just don't want people to get offended, right? <laughs> I'm moving on, I'm moving on. All right. So this is, and, and what I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're feeling unfulfilled, one of the best things that can help you is to fast in order to be filled. Fast in order to be filled. We don't like doing it. It's, it's hard to deny ourselves, uh, but it, it drives us back to this place of daily dependence. Fasting drives us to this idea that it's okay to feel dependent on God. All right, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. In Luke 4, 4, when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, he told the devil, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you are feeling unfulfilled spiritually, I want to encourage you to maybe enter into a season of fasting. Right? And if you're not, if you, if you don't do a lot of fasting, or you've never done fasting, uh, you know, look up Daniel fast. It, 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 that's more about taking all the enjoyable foods out of your life. Right? That's, and it's not the... the, the I don't want to get into a whole fasting thing, but the, the, a lot of people miss the Daniel fast, and they think Daniel fast is the first chapter of Daniel. That's not a Daniel fast. That's a Daniel diet. The Daniel fast comes later in the book when Daniel denied himself wine, sweet things, meat, anything fatty, right? He just kind of pared it all down to, you know, it's kind of like just brown rice and and lentils, you know, it's just with no flavoring, no seasoning, just enough energy to, to be able to do his job effectively. If you're going to do just a water fast, every time we see that in the Bible, they're like a way for a retreat out in the wilderness where you can just sit there and go, oh, I've got no energy, right? If you've got to actually show up and work, you, your body needs the calories, and it's not what I've... Because I've tried it. I've tried doing water fast while doing construction, and, you know, you're just, like, dangerous, you know? And, and, and it's not an effective way to fast because you're still working, and all you do is feel weak, and, and it doesn't help you press into the Lord. You're just struggling with feeling emaciated, not able to do your responsibilities effectively. So I always like when I'm having to work or or teach a lot and stuff like that, I'll lean into a Daniel fast where, you know, I'm just drinking juice or stuff like that. And, and, like, and not like, you know, uh, well, I will break down occasionally if I'm out, but it's not like go to Jamba Juice and get a 47, you know, a 74 ounce orange dream, you know, or a cookie peanut butter smoothie because I'm juicing, right? And it's 2,400 calories <laughs> that I'm going to suck down in four minutes. Right? That's not the kind of fasting. I'm talking about denying yourself the pleasure of eating and just eating to... Because that, that also drives us to where am I getting my satisfaction? And I'll admit, I'm a foodie. I love to cook and I love great food. Right? I love tasty food. And a lot of times when I am feeling down or discouraged, I'll go to in and out or I'll go get a chocolate shake somewhere. Right? Just, that just fills that sense of satisfaction. And fasting helps make you hungry and realize, no, I need to go to God for that satisfaction today. So go to God's word for fulfillment every single day. And that's it. That's the, 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 the three kind of main uh, ideas here. When you encounter divine difficulty, when you come across bitter circumstances, when you've got depleted resources in your life, cry out to God. Seek God. 
Go gather from his word every single day. Get the Bible app. Join in. You can join in. Start being a part of that. Let's go out and gather. And I, because I, I think about this, when you would be this community out in the desert and you go out gathering, think about the camaraderie that would be there in the morning. Right? It, it, a lot of times we think it because, and I think sometimes our, what I like about the prayer app, the reason I bring this up, not the prayer app, the Bible reading app, is that it, it gives you kind of a sense of community. That, oh, hey, look at all these other people, right? I'm up pretty early usually. I'm reading pretty early. And I'm like, oh, wow, Bill beat me this morning, <laughs> right? Bill got up before I did, you know? And, and it gives a sense of, hey, we're in this together. And I think they probably had that as they went out to gather, don't you? You know, you kind of park your tent by the same families and you get up and you're like, hey, hey, Zub, how's it going? It's okay, right? It's good. You know, and as you're out there gathering, you're talking about life and you're connecting and it helps build this sense of community. So I just really want to encourage you to do that. And, and then to wrap it up, why don't you do some prayer time? I'm just going to have you come up and play. All right, Father, thank you for your word, for the example people of Israel that we can apply to our lives today, we want to be your people. We want to step into the reality of what it means to be free and take advantage of all the things that you give us in order to stay in that freedom, to thrive in that freedom. Help us be people who embrace that daily dependence. That's just who we are. We're people who turn bitter things sweet. We're people who cry out to you in difficulty, and we're not people who complain. We're not people who think the world has something better to offer. We're not people who move on. We're people that are expressions of your grace, your goodness, your faithfulness. So God, would you... Give us the faith to to lean into these things, to embrace them with all our heart. We trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.